Hey everyone, just a quick note to share before we start the show. Here at SmartLogic, we are currently hiring for a mid-level Rails developer. We're looking for someone with experience equivalent to two to three years working on a large Ruby on Rails projects. If this is you or anyone you know, head on over to smartlogic.workable.com to apply. We're taking applications from anywhere in the U.S. since we're all remote at this point anyways. And you won't stay programming in Rails forever, so the chance of future Elixir work is high. Okay, now here's the show. Welcome to Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by Smart Logic, a custom web and mobile development shop based in Baltimore. My name is Justice Ethan, and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by my co-host, the excellent Eric Ostrich. Hey, Eric. Hello. And as you may or may not know, this season's theme is system and application architecture. We're very blessed to be joined today by special guest, Johanna Larson. Hi. Johanna, we're so glad to have you on the show. You're a well-known contributor in the community. See you at all the conferences, and we're so glad that we're finally able to get you on the show. You're calling us from London right now. It's a little bit late over there. I'm curious, what's it like in London these days? Because the world is just such a strange place. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's getting a lot better in the sense that things are opening up. I moved to London in March, just before lockdown, which was not great timing. People were really panicking. I mean, all the grocery stores were empty, could not find toilet paper. I mean, I remember standing in the lobby of the lobby, like the reception area or the ground floor of the building I live in. And one of my neighbors came in with a bag of toilet paper and was like, Sainsbury's down the street has toilet paper. And I'd like run over to get some before they ran out. I literally got the last package. Wow. What took you there? And where were you moving there from? So I'm Swedish, lived in Sweden all my life. I've been working with, I've had a lot of interesting jobs, but basically after getting involved in the Elixir community, it's just an amazing community. It's so warm and welcoming. And I just knew that I wanted an Elixir job. So when I was looking for a new job, I felt like I had to look outside of Sweden. Not a lot of options staying in Malmo in southern Sweden. So that's why I ended up in London. So does Sweden only have uh, Erlang jobs then? There, I mean, there are jobs. There are definitely jobs, especially in Stockholm. But I felt like if I'm moving to Stockholm, I might as well look somewhere else as well. All right. So how did you get into programming? in the first place. How did I get into programming? I mean, I remember in high school, I had friends who got into programming. They uh, took classes, they got so excited about it. And they were telling me like they were trying to get me excited. And I was like, No way, that is not for me. I'm never ever going to do that. It's just boring. And I stuck to that opinion for a fairly long time. I don't remember exactly what brought me into it, but I mean, back then, pretty much everyone had to learn HTML of some sort because that's like social media sites back then. You designed your own profile page and you, you used HTML tags and stuff to do that. That turned into sort of, okay, well, if I can do that, I can make a web page. But now that I have a web page, what do I do with it? Well, I have to host it somewhere. So I learned how to set up web servers. And I learned how to set up a Linux server. And then I was like, oh, well, you could put some like interactive content in here. Well, okay, I have to learn JavaScript. So I learned JavaScript. And it just kept building on it that way. So I learned PHP, databases, et cetera. And I realized that actually this is, this is pretty amazing. So this is interesting. I don't think I've ever heard of anyone being, maybe this isn't the right term, but like peer pressured into programming before. <laughs> no, they definitely tried. That's really cool. What uh, when you were getting started, like how did you how did you learn? What resources were very valuable to you? Anything that you could recommend or would stand the test of time? I guess back then you didn't really have access to a lot of video content. It was mostly books. I had you know those basic beginner lamp stack kind of books. That's how I get into programming in general. I honestly, I'm not a huge fan of video content. It's for me, I want to be able to like jump back and forth and it's really awkward with with a video and it, the pace is a bit too slow. So I definitely prefer books. Mm, mm. 
I forget who said it, but they said the fastest way to learn is to read. The next fastest way is to listen and the slowest way is to watch. And I always thought that was interesting. Can you talk about maybe after that initial learning period, what was your first programming job and how you got it? Right. Yeah. So when I realized that I was into programming, I decided to do like a bachelor's program to get a degree. I didn't do it in computer science. I did it in a sort of information systems design program. It covered pretty much everything. We did process change, organizational structure, group psychology, everything. We had a little bit of programming in there. I guess I mostly learned on my own. And then I was lucky enough to sort of befriend one of my teachers who was involved in a local company. So after I finished my degree, I went there to work. It was a nice place to work, really friendly people, but the work itself was awful. I became a SharePoint expert, and I don't know if you've ever used SharePoint, but it is not the nicest piece of software to use, and it's much, much worse to program. It is this Frankenstein's monster of just generations of code built on top of code, built on top of code, and you turn into this sort of programming archaeologist where you sort of dig through the layers and you can find, you can find like, oh, wait, here are the CSS rules follow a completely different naming scheme. And you can totally tell that this was, this is like 10 years old. Wow. That sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you, you just moved to London to start at a new company. What company is that? And, and what do you do there? So I work for a company called Duffel. It's about two years old, but it's still, I'd say, a fairly early stage startup. They stuck to being a fairly small team for a long time and worked in stealth and only recently became publicly known. The idea, the concept like, is like Stripe is for credit cards, Duffel is for booking flights. So it's generally not really, it's not aimed at end users like the it's not aimed at normal people consumers it's aimed at companies who want to build integrations with airlines and offer bookings so travel agencies or if you want to set up a site that sells custom vacation trips etc this is the way to go and the reason for it is that if you look at what does it actually take to integrate with airlines and make and book flights it's incredibly complicated it is just a swamp. And our goal is to build something on top of that, you know, build something out of all these unreliable components and turn it into something that's actually really nice to work with. Oh my gosh, this is one of the coolest ideas I've heard of in such a long time. Are you I would be so pumped to work there if I were you. Congratulations. <laughs> that's so cool. I'm Thank looking you. at their site. It's just sweet. Yeah, it's a really pretty landing page. So I'm not going to just start talking about API documentation right now because that would not make, maybe it would make for a good episode, actually. I don't know. Talk, because you're a big contributor in the community. We see you at all the conferences. Can you talk about, you know, some of the work that you've done in the community, uh, open source maybe, or or just any other projects that you'd like to share with the audience? Sure, absolutely. I guess the big one that I would talk about is Hexdiff, which has been a real honor and pleasure to be involved in working on that product. Or it's not a product, but site. For everyone who doesn't know what Hexdiff is, I'll give you a short introduction. Yeah. So basically, when you work with dependencies, you're using software dependencies, you very often just bring them in. And it's very easy to do so. You have access to all these amazing, you have this huge repository of code that someone else wrote for you. And that's what we do nowadays. We just reuse all this amazing code that people build and really like stand on the shoulders of giants. But while we, when we work with our own code, we have, we often have systems in place to maintain the quality of that code and to ensure that we're not making mistakes. So we do pull requests, we have code review, we really put a lot of effort into our own code. But then when we bring in dependencies, we just put them in the list and they get loaded. And they run in production just like everything else. We don't really spend a lot of time looking at it. And even if we wanted to, the main place we would look would be GitHub. The problem with looking at GitHub is that the code you're running doesn't actually come from GitHub. 
In the case of Elixir, you bring it, bring it in from Hex, and the code that is on Hex might not necessarily be the same code that's on GitHub. Now I'm like putting on my tinfoil hat, and and uh, so I used to work for a cybersecurity company, so I've really like spent a lot of time thinking about this kind of stuff. But basically, with Hex diff, what you get is a site built and maintained by the Hex team that gets the code directly from the Hex registry, the same code that it gets deployed with your production servers. And it pulls it down. It lets you diff different versions of the of a package that you're using. So you can see the changes that were introduced between two packages. So when you're bumping your dependencies, you can check exactly what you're putting into production, what you're using. Part of it is it's a really nice UI. It's really pretty, really proud of the work that we put into it. And it's, I feel, fairly easy to use. So if you haven't tried it out, you should definitely check it out. It's diff.hex.pm. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience working on the diff tool? Like, how did you get started? How did you get pulled into the project? What was the initial problem that you were trying to solve? And kind of how did you think about going about solving it? Yeah, absolutely. So the last company I worked for, we put a lot of effort into keeping track of and maintaining our dependencies. So my coworkers, this was a mostly a Ruby shop. My coworkers built a site for doing these kinds of diffs for Ruby packages. You should check that out as well. It's koditsu.io, diff.koditsu.io. It's Magic Mansfeld and Tomek PR, Tomash. They built this really cool tool for diffing Ruby packages. And I realized that because we had a little bit of Elixir code in production as well, that we should totally do this for Elixir as well. Luckily, around that time, Wojtek Mack from the Hex team had introduced, I believe it was Wojtek who introduced it, a uh, command for mix. So it's mix hex.package diff, I believe, that lets you diff different versions of a package of uh, an Elixir Erlang package in the command line. And it, you get this nice output that you can look at. And I thought, well, if he's really done all of the work, all I need to do is put this on a web page and make it pretty. So I made the quickest, hackiest version. After talking to Wojtek at our conference, actually, I just made a really quick, hacky version. I got a chance to use LiveView, which is a lot of fun. And I put that out as just sort of an example of what this, this could be like. And I didn't really expect anyone to care. This was mostly something that I built for myself to use. But it turned out that a lot of people got really excited about it. So I ended up talking to the Hex team and they thought it was a great idea. So we we built it. So does it currently still more or less work the same way as your initial kind of like hacky version work? Or have you changed? It's been like totally rewritten or tell me about sort of the evolution of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot more reliable now. (laughs) The first version I did was, like I said, it it shelled out to mix on the command line, basically. And I didn't want to bring in a database or anything. That's too much effort. So I used ETS tables to cache the diffs, which sounds like it would be really scary because the diffs that you generate can be really large, but somehow it just works. That was really impressive. The only code part really in the first version was the live view UI that lets you select the different versions. The proper version, the official version uses GCP storage for the diffs, which makes it a lot more reliable. It also, thanks to Eric Meadows, Yonso, I should mention everyone, it's also Todd Resedek, all great, really like just amazing people, really, really fun to work with. I've been so helpful through this project. It was just saying, yeah, Eric added streaming functionality to this. So the whole thing is completely streaming and can basically handle just ginormous diffs, which in some cases, like some packages, I'm not really sure what they did, but the diffs that are outputted are just hundreds of megabytes. Essentially, it just it just works. So we have the GCP storage for diffs, still have the live view front end. The ETS table is kind of there still. So... One really cool thing that that I relied on was the Hex team built a library for interacting with the Hex registry called Hex Core. It's an Erlang project, but it's really in- easy to uh, use from Elixir as well. That has, it basically just 
knows how to talk to the registry and the API, and you just call these pre-made functions, really convenient. That gives you access to things like, okay, I want all of the package names of all packages, Elixir packages. I want all versions. And then all I did was make it searchable. That's awesome. Yeah, I just loaded Phoenix 1.18 to 1.53, and that was pretty big, and it slowly crept its way in. (laughs) So that's pretty cool. Yeah, part of the effort is in the browser. The first version I made did all of the HTML rendering in the browser using a JavaScript library. So with large diffs, it would hang your browser for a given number of seconds, which could be a little bit scary. The new version renders everything on the server side, so all the effort is done by the servers. The diffs are saved, like I mentioned before, and then you get the HTML sent to your browser. So it's a, it's a lot nicer to your browser. So are the diffs generated on the... If no one had ever requested 1.18, Phoenix to 1.53, is it generated kind of on the fly, saved to GCP? And then like the next time I hit this, it just loads it from that cache? Or is it pre-cached, I guess? It is not pre-cached. They're generated on the fly. There are some some sort of caveats. One thing we realized fairly early on was that even though... So whenever you use a cache, the trick is figuring out the right thing to key, like the right cache key to use. And if you're not using the right cache key, you're not going to get the results you want. So the cache key includes the package name and the versions, obviously. We also have a way of clearing the cache or making it invalid because since we do the rendering, since we like cache the rendered content, if we change the rendering itself, we also need to invalidate the cache. But the thing that's missing is that, let's think about another, let's put our tinfoil hats back on and do another one of these like scenarios. So let's say that you're uploading a package and it contains malicious code and you want to hide it from people. So what you do is you upload a nice version of the package. You then go to diff and you generate the diff. It gets cached. It's stored now. And then you go back to HexPM and you re-upload your package. And this is something you can do if it's a completely, like they might have changed the rules, but the way I remember it is if it's a completely new package, you have 24 hours to re-upload it. If in case you've made mistakes. And if it's a new version of an existing package, you have an hour, I think. At least there is some sort of grace period where you can correct any mistakes you made. So an attacker would be able to use that to re-upload with a malicious version, but diff wouldn't update because it's been cached. So the last component that we save is the uh, checksum of the package itself. Yeah, I feel like that's something... I definitely wouldn't have thought of, so I'm glad <laughs> Glad uh, there's some more people with, with bigger tinfoil hats out there. <laughs> All right, so this season's theme is, is architecture, right? So one thing that we like to ask everyone is, what does architecture mean to you? That is an interesting question. To me, architecture is very much sort of dusty. It's the right word to use for it. It's a word that I sort of associate with someone who doesn't actually write code. It's the person who's the architect of the system, not necessarily really involved in in executing it. Someone who sits at a whiteboard and or with a UML diagram in front of them. And the thing is, when you're in that, like really when you're at that level, everything just works. You just put your components together and they look really pretty and all the all the pieces, everything just fits together. And then reality comes in and whoever's implementing it realizes that actually there's so many exceptions to this and just have to keep adding special modules and and do all kinds of workarounds to make the architecture work. I mean, I realize that that not every architect is going to be this way. Like I'm exaggerating it. That is sort of my initial reaction. Can you maybe dive into how you see the difference between code architecture and code design? Absolutely. I mean, there's a very basic answer where you have, I mean, design is the sort of what do the modules do while the architecture is the overall overview of the the big picture, the infrastructure of the system. I guess in many ways, the the architecture is more of a strategy, like a high level sort of direction that you want want the system to take. And you think about your business requirements and you think about what does the system actually need to be like? Does it need to be really flexible? Does it need to be really secure? 
those kinds of things while you're talking about the actual design of the system, you're going down to the practical level and talking about, okay, these modules do these things. These modules ha- have these concerns and these, this is how they interact with each other. Mm. We ask this question on every show in this season. And I think that this is one of my favorite answers I've heard so far. Designs and the specifics. That's really good. Do you have any opinions on domain driven design? Not really overall. One of the interesting things I think about the domain driven design is the emphasis it puts on the domain experts, which I think is such a funny thing. I feel like software engineering is the only area, software engineers are the only people that have to be told that if they're building a system, like, okay, so you're in healthcare, you're building a system for healthcare, it's a booking system for a clinic that nurses are supposed to use and interact with. And domain driven, like software or software engineers are the only people in who need to be reminded that they actually need to go talk to the nurses to see what they need from the system. We kind of go into this, this mode where we're like, well, I know how to write the code for this. I can make assumptions of what they need and I can just build this. Uh, so that's, that's something that I think is really valuable in domain driven design is the emphasis on the people who actually know what the system should do. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I wonder if real life building architects spend a lot of time with the end users of the buildings that they're going to make. I think part of that, like the, one of the things in, in design, I guess this is design versus architecture, but like one of the big things is like when you walk up to a door, how do you immediately know how to pull or push it? That right there is like someone not actually interacting with the person (laughs) to like know how people will be able to use it. That's from uh, design of everyday things, right? I think so. Yeah. So we wanted to ask you a little bit more about your process and especially around what kind of pre-code planning you do. What's your process from the beginning when you have to build something new? So I would say, and I guess this kind of ties into my my opinions on architecture as well, is my approach is probably very practical. I guess that's one of the things that I like so much about Elixir and Erlang is that it's a very practical, it's a very pragmatic language. I think uh, Brooklyn Zelenka talked about that in one of her keynotes, that while many languages, many programming languages are designed around this, some core idea, some concept that of programming language theory that someone wanted to introduce and spread and they built the language on top of it, Erlang was built to solve a problem. It wasn't built to try out like, what would it look like if we have a completely lazy language, for example. Instead it was, okay, so we actually need to build these, these telecom switches or whatever they're called, and we need these to work all the time and the actual design of the language is not that important as long as it solves the problem itself. So a very pragmatic, very practical language in that sense. And that really resonates with me because that's also the way that I would approach solving a problem. To answer your question, I would probably, I mean, first of all, I would spend time with the team to make sure that we're building the right thing, that we know what we're doing. But as soon as possible, I would want to start working on a prototype. And my process would be more around iterating on that prototype, start building. And as soon as you start building, that's when you realize the questions you need to ask to figure out what you actually need to get to the finished product. And then working with with your code base in a way where you can constantly iterate and improve based on the requirements. That, and in real life, these requirements are going to change. They're not going to stay where they were in the beginning. That's something that I really learned from the last big project I worked at, my last job, is it started out as, oh, look, there's this cool platform we could use. We could do something cool with it. And this really undefined, vague project. And I started building it. And uh, I was writing the code. And I saw these patterns. And I thought, well, great, I can do some abstractions. So I built abstractions based on the patterns that I saw and I built a product and it did what it was intended to do based on our first first ideas. And I showed it to the stakeholders and they were like, this is great, but we have some changes we want to make. And I was like, okay, great. I wrote everything down. I went back to the code base and I realized that I have to throw everything out because 
with the change requirements, the abstractions that I thought were perfect for this product didn't work anymore. And I feel like this is something that I really got out of this project, uh, something that I learned, a great experience for me, was that introducing these abstractions early on or just introducing strict abstractions in general in a world where your requirements are very likely to change is often not a very good idea. Mm, mm. That's such a good point. And we have to deal with, I mean, we obviously work with clients a lot at Smart Logic, And so there's always this balance between velocity, time put in into upfront planning and understanding. And also, I mean, you mentioned getting the prototype started, which helps you identify some of the questions you need to ask. I can completely identify with this process. What about like currently, can you tell us a little bit about whatever level of detail you're able to get into, but like what kind of architecture are you currently working with? Microservices, micro lists, monoliths, like do you want to talk a little bit about sort of your current experience with architecture? Absolutely. I'm talking in the context of my current employer. Since it's a system built to integrate with other systems, it's built on top of other systems, we integrate with all these airlines, it has to account for a lot of unreliability. And the architecture is designed around that. So we have clearly defined layers where one part of the code is intended to communicate with airlines. It contains airline-specific code. And then we have another layer that is intended to be, that's our own code base. That's our own data structures. And we have a conversion layer between them. So we try to be very strict in separating these things. And one of the, I'd say that it's it's not a microservice architecture, but it is an umbrella app. Hmm. And so I'd never used an umbrella before. The only experience I had of umbrellas was secondhand accounts from Slack and the forums. And most of what you hear are complaints and problems. And I very much got the impression that umbrellas are maybe not a great idea. I also got the impression that umbrellas are very often used as a tool of of separation of concerns, Mm. which is not necessarily what it does especially when you use the sort of umbrella functionality where you run commands from the root level, you in fact have no separation of concerns at all because all of the apps in the umbrella are loaded and all the apps can call into the other apps. All the modules are loaded. You can call any public function from any app. There's no separation. This is something where I think there are great things about umbrellas, but separation of concerns is not necessarily something you get out of it. There are ways... And I, I think that even though I came into it and I thought we need to get rid of the umbrella, like my first thought was we have to get rid of it. It's not going to work. Let's, we can just replace all of the apps with folders, have all the code in the same place. This is how we're using it anyway. I have actually sort of come around and we are, or like I really, I, I feel like it's worth investing in the umbrella, but it takes, I think the thing that's missing for umbrellas to be more useful is probably tooling. And there are some things you can do to enforce that separation of concerns a bit more in an umbrella context. Uh, one great trick is using mix CMD mix test, I think is the command. So normally in an umbrella, if you run mix test, it loads all of the apps and then runs the tests for each app through all of the apps. The problem there is that all of the apps are loaded and each app will load all of its dependencies. So a dependency of one app is available to another app, even if it doesn't explicitly define it. If you use mix CMD, mix test, it loads each app separately into its own Erlang VM. So it doesn't have access to the other apps or the other apps dependencies. And that sort of enforces the separation of the apps. You can't accidentally call into a different app, at least not in your test, and lose that separation of concern. That's pretty neat. I yeah, didn't did not know about this mix CMD. We'll have a link to the docs. I want to follow up on one part, which is you mentioned that one thing that umbrella apps are missing at this point is tooling. Could you give a little bit more idea of what kind of tooling should be developed in the future? We always try to give listeners an idea of what kind of maybe open source projects they could work on to contribute to the community. Yeah, absolutely. Part of the problem is that Umbrellas are not 
necessarily intended to be a tool for separation of concerns. It's a way of running easily running apps together that don't necessarily need to run together in the real world. It's a development tool. Mm. However, in practice, it's often used in something that's where the apps are not necessarily ever going to run separately. They're always going to run together. But instead, it's used as a sort of, it's really nice to see like, okay, we have this one app. It covers these behaviors or function dysfunctionality in the application. And we have another app and we have a clear sort of interface between them and how to communicate. And for everyone who uses it that way, the tooling is not necessarily very helpful there. It would take, but I think improving the tooling there also requires getting community agreement on the purpose of umbrellas. You would actually need to convince everyone that, okay, but in practice, this is what people use it for. So let's invest into it. I think that a lot of what the core team is working on right now, if you look at the uh, Elixir 1.11 compiler improvements, you see a lot of things that are actually useful for umbrella projects, such as much improved warnings when you're doing things. If So if you run compile with, if you try using Elixir Master and you run compile in a sub app in an umbrella and you don't have your dependencies properly configured, it will show warnings that you're calling it, uh, modules that are not available, which is something that earlier versions of Elixir didn't do for mix. Cool. So I guess at your last company, you were security focused. So you ended up making diff.hex.pm. So now that you're interacting with umbrellas a lot, are we going to see something from you come out <laughs> around this tooling wise? That might be. Uh, this is umbrellas are still something that I'm I'm learning. It comes up a little bit every day. Things like okay, but in what order are apps in an umbrella actually loaded? Is it based on dependencies or is it based on alphabetical order? There's so many questions that is there still so much to learn for me on umbrellas. Another thing that I've been looking at a lot is because airline APIs are all SOAP, so it's XML. They're not very shy. They send you huge payloads of XML to parse. One of the things that I've been looking into is XML parsing. That's a really fun area. And it's also a great excuse to write a little bit of Rust and using, I don't know if you've ever used Rustler, which is a package for uh, working with Rust NIFs. It's amazing. It is such an impressive library. I was so surprised the first time I used it and I built my first NIF. I did not expect it to just work. It literally just worked. I was shocked. I just sat there with my coworker. We were just staring at each other. could not believe that it just ran the first time we've tried. I, I've loved so much of this conversation. I, I want to give you some time to talk a little bit about professional growth and both for yourself and also for people that you maybe have mentored. How do you think about growing your own skill set and how do you think about growing the skill sets of people on your team? That is something that I've thought a lot about lately. It is something that I was really looking for when end of the year, beginning of this end of last year, beginning of this year, when I was looking for a new job, one of the main things I was looking for was a place to grow. Something that I felt that I had been missing was having a team of people around me working on the same things and basically someone to challenge me to keep growing. I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of nice things about being sort of a big fish in a small pond or just being the only person on your team, you can you can make all the decisions. Nobody's going to criticize you. You get everything the way you want. There's no question about formatting or style changes. Like it's if you want semicolons, you're going to get semicolons. But you also lose this sort of thing where maybe you're working really hard on something, and then you see your coworkers. They're just building these amazing things, and it challenges you to work even harder and to grow even more. That's been really useful, or it's been huge for me at the place I'm working right now, it's just having great coworkers. I can second that. Third. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So for our, our last question here, do you have a favorite underrated Elixir resource? 
Oh, wow. Underrated. So I, I do have favorite resources. For me, early on getting into the community, the Elixir Slack was amazing. It is a great place to ask questions, but it's also a great place to just, something I do is I just check once or twice a day, just read through some of the questions and the answers and you just pick up so much stuff. That was really useful to me, but I don't know if it counts as underrated. It's definitely, I I rate it very highly. No, that's that's a really good answer. We want to make sure that we give you a chance to have any like final plugs or asks for the audience anything you want the audience to do or to know about now is the time the floor is yours sure i mean we've already talked about it but i'll I'll plug it again if you haven't checked out diff.hex.pm you should definitely do it it is an open source project there are some pretty cool things in the code base you de- should definitely check it out it's not huge it is the kind of project where you can definitely just spend a little bit of time on getting into it and you can follow the code. It's not, the abstractions are not deep enough that you're, that you're going to get lost. So it's a great way to get introduced to some concepts in Elixir. It's a cool little piece of live view code in there as well. And if you try it out and you think of some improvement that could be made to it, feel free to make an issue or even better, make a PR because that's something that we're really excited about. We've gotten some really great improvements from people. So you should definitely check it out. All right, Johanna, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really glad we finally got someone to come on and say good things about Umbrella Projects, because we've been looking for that. (laughs) And it's really been a pleasure. We hope you'll come back to join us again soon. Before we close out, we've got to share another edition of Pattern Matching with Todd. Friend of the podcast, Todd Resedek, is asking members of the Elixir community five questions to help us all get to know each other better. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Pattern Matching, where I ask members of the Elixir community the same five questions in an effort to get to know them better. My guest today is best known as the co-author of the Elixir GraphQL library, Absinthe. He's taking time away from his work at GitHub to be with me. Welcome, Bruce Williams. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on. Big fan of of GraphQL and Absinthe. So thank you for all your hard work on that. Ben as well. Thank you. So let's start out with the uh, first question is, where were you born? Sure. So I I was born on Williams Air Force Base in Arizona back in 1980. I was born on an Air Force Base because both of my parents were in the Air Force at the time. That makes sense. Yeah. And... I ended up going into the Air Force myself years later, so with some foreshadowing there. Okay, wow! I didn't I didn't realize you served. Thank you for your service. Thanks. So, how long were you in the Air Force for? What rank did you attain? I was in for six years. I left in two thousand four as staff sergeant. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it was a different life. <laughs> so next time I see you, I'm going to address you as Staff Sergeant Williams. So you were born in Arizona. And where are you these days? Where do you live? These days, I live in Portland, Oregon. I moved here about 10 years ago with my, with my wife and two sons. And now there's three sons. And we've decided to stop having sons at this point or daughters. We're definitely finished. Excellent. Yeah, they, they each come with their own set of problems. We don't need to go into details. But anybody that has sons will know what I'm talking about. So what part of Portland are you in? I am in Southeast Portland. I live probably about 15, 20 minute drive to downtown. If I was driving to downtown instead of locking myself in my house, which is what I'm doing these days. But yeah, it's close enough in that I could easily jump on a bike. If anyone knows Portland, I live essentially in the, uh, in the Woodstock neighborhood. It's kind of a nice, a nice neighborhood. Cool. And does GitHub have an office there that you would work out of? So GitHub does have like a co-working space up in North Portland. I have never been there. I've worked for GitHub for a year and a half. I haven't been there, but there are people that you, that make use of that. GitHub is a largely remote company. Right now it's a 100% remote company. They do a pretty good job of supporting people in their home offices. And that's how I prefer to work. It's how I've worked probably for the last 10 years. I could go up there though and visit. And I plan to back once people are starting to use that office again. Ah, uh, okay. And just uh, for my own edification, when you say North Portland, 
That's on the east side of the river up by the airport? It's on the east side of the river. Well, northeast is by the airport. It's Portland has essentially five quadrants, which of course makes no sense. North Portland is like this sliver between the Willamette River and directionally north. It's that triangular portion up there. Okay. Today I learned. Yes. It's a weird thing. And I guess we're going to be adding another quadrant. So we're not going to be changing the word quadrant. We're just going to be adding new sections. A sixth quadrant. That makes total sense. I think they're going to do a south, a south Portland or something. I've heard that. Why wouldn't you? Yes. All right. So we, uh, we kind of touched on question two already, but we can Mm -hmm. get into a little bit more detail. So have you had any careers before programming? Yeah. So when I was in the Air Force, I was an Arabic cryptologic linguist. I left as soon as I got out of high school. Um, a week later, I joined the Air Force, partly because I really didn't know what I wanted to do in, in college. I know I wanted to do something academic. There was an academic discipline in the Air Force, well, all the armed services, which is linguist. And I qualified for that via testing. And I just I went off to Monterey, California and picked that up and did that for the next six years. It was an interesting time to do it. I did it in 1998 and I stayed in until 2004. So as you can imagine, it was a busy time for someone that learned how to translate Arabic. Okay. So yeah, Arabic cryptologist, linguist makes me think that you A, had to learn the Arabic language or at least the spoken language. Mm -hmm. And then there's some cryptology aspect to it. There's some cryptology aspect to it, yes. So you not only have to translate from this cryptological coding, but you have to translate that into a foreign language. Well, people use codes. So yeah, militaries use codes. So it's it's a kind of a multidisciplinary thing uh, where you're, you're doing both the language and it involves using equipment and it uses using different techniques. But yeah, it's an interesting, very strange kind of job to have, especially when you're 19 years old. Indeed. And so did you learn software development while you were in the Air Force as well? So I had started picking up software development when I was probably like 13, 14 years old, messing around. Uh, I, had, I was, it was very lucky. I grew up with computers pretty early for someone that was born in 1980. I mean, I had a computer since I was I've been pretty young, the old black and green monochromes and doing batch file scripting. I got into VB as soon as VB was a thing, but it it kind of fell by the wayside when I was in high school and when I was in the Air Force and during the war, there was a lot of data flying around and it was kind of hard to get a handle on all of it. And so I started to do data mining, uh, which is why I'm pretty good at regular expressions because I had to use them a lot. I did a lot of Perl and Python those days. Ruby in 2001. And when I got out of the Air Force in 2004, that was really in 2000, 2001, I decided that's what I wanted to do. That was the thing that was interesting to me the most. And so when I got out in 2004, I jumped right into it. Wow. Okay. So what was your first computer? I know I I programmed BASIC on a uh, Commodore VIC-20 was where I got started. The first one that I can remember was, I think, a Packard Bell. I think that's the first one I can I can remember. But I think we had I think we had something before. I didn't really care what it was. So I didn't really think about it at the time. You know, it's just it was something to play text based games. And in retrospect, they were terrible. But at the time, they were just the best thing in the world. Huh. So. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know any better. Yeah. Well, and things change. Like I'm sure in ten years we'll be like, what the heck was that? So oh, definitely you know, it always, always happens. And then there's games like the Untitled Goose Game that roll mm-hmm. back the clock and they're still yes. great. Right. Stardew Valley, same thing, you know. I actually, I love it because that means that we can take these old games, like old Sierra games, like King's Quest and things like Myst, and those kind of get revamped and pushed out. And, you know, my kids like them. So I think it's pretty cool. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, moving on. What's the genre of the last song or the last album you listened to? The last song that I listened to that I can remember was El Bujo by Blanco White, um, which is just, he's a, he's a British born guitarist. He learned flamenco. He's, he's kind of inspired by Spanish and Bolivian music. I like singer songwriters a lot. I like flamenco music a lot. Um, 
Uh, I have tried to learn how to play guitar. I can never grow out my fingernails long enough to play flamenco music, uh, nor do I have the time and the focus to do that. But yeah, I, I listen to a lot of music, though, a pretty wide taste in music. But that's the last one that I remember remember listening to. OK, cool. I was not familiar with that artist at all. So maybe some of our listeners are. What movie will you watch anytime you come across it on TV? Hmm. So the other day, my, my sons were watching Groundhog Day. Um, with Bill Murray. And uh, I totally, you know, I've been trying to get them to get off the video games at some reasonable hour and maybe watch a movie together as a family. And I was not expecting to be drawn into Groundhog Day, but I can't help myself whenever that thing turns on. So I sat and watched the whole thing. And I mean, I think it's hard when you grow up in the 80s not to like Bill Murray. He's just everywhere, Ghostbusters. So I, I love him as an actor and as a comedian. But also, I just really like the I like the story behind Groundhog Day. I love his slow descent into madness, and I love how he turns out, you know, coming from a, a very very selfish background and kind of redeeming himself and the ability to you know spend was was probably I think I've I've heard something like it was like thirty years worth of time that he would have had to spend to learn how to play piano and everything else. It was just it's an amazing story, and it's also. Groundhog Day is February 2nd. My birthday is February 1st. So I've also felt a particular affinity to it. Oh, a special time of the year for you. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people talking about this quarantine time being like Groundhog Day. And yeah. I've definitely noticed some people descending into madness. Yes. Myself included. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully we all come out of it being better people at the end. Yeah, I hope so. There's definitely days where, you know, you're you're sitting there, you're eating food that's probably not that good for you for like the fourth or fifth day in a row. Maybe you're playing a little too much Animal Crossing, although I kind of think of that as a a mental health requirement at this point because Animal Crossing is so nice and calm. And you're like, should I be learning something at this point? And people are telling you things like, you know, Isaac Newton did this oh. or so-and-so did this when they were in prison. And I think that sets the standards a little too high. So I think we need to give ourselves a give ourselves a break. But uh, like I have a piano behind me right now, which I do not know how to play very well at all. And so I should probably spend some more time doing that. Hopefully I'll get to that during the quarantine. Huh. Yeah, and Isaac Newton. I mean, gravity is so obvious. Give me a break. <laughs> I mean, an apple hit you in the head. Give, I give mean, me a break. That, that's a gimme. Um, cool. Well, wrapping up, final question. What project are you most excited about? about working on next? I think the right answer for many people right now is probably anything with Phoenix 1.5. Anything with LiveView, I'm very excited about that. I mentioned Animal Crossing earlier. I really need to build a queuing thing for Animal Crossing because the turn of exchange is just too much of a mess. A ton of GitHubers play Animal Crossing all together, which is kind of cool. So I don't know, maybe I'll do something like that, something silly. I don't get to use Elixir day to day at, at GitHub yet. So I do need an outlet, and maybe that's something that I'll do to play around a little bit with LiveView. Very cool. Well, thanks for joining me today, Bruce. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. That's it for this episode of Elixir Wizards. Thanks again to Johanna Larson for being a guest on the show and for being such a great contributor to this community. My co-host, Eric Ostrich, thank you for being my co-host. And once again, I'm Justice Epen. Elixir Wizards is a Smart Logic podcast. Here at Smart Logic, we're always looking to take on new projects, building web applications in Elixir, Rails, and React, infrastructure projects using Kubernetes, and mobile apps using React Native. We'd love to hear from you if you have a project we could help you with. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast player. Share us on all the interwebs. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, as well as Eric, so add us on all those. I'm Justice Epen, and Eric is Eric Ostrich on all those different platforms. And join us again next week on Elixir Wizards for more on system and application architecture. Mm -hmm.